Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Health Heal Thrive podcast. My guest today is Carla Veith Carter. I'm excited to talk to her for the first time. We've kind of been, you know, around the same spaces and, uh, you know, haven't really had a lot to do with each other up until now, but I'm super excited to talk to her because she is going to be a part of the lived experience conference. It's coming up in Melbourne in June. Thank you for being a part of that, Carla, and thanks for talking to us today. Oh, no problem. I'm very happy to be here. Well, you are a keto coach. I'm just looking at your little bio here. Keto coach, a nutritionist, a speaker, a health psych graduate, um, and you have had a real lived experience around uh, healing fibromyalgia, your adrenals, and you talk about sleep, energy, and weight. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. It's, uh, you know, low carbon keto has literally changed my life. So Um, tell us about that. How did, how did that all happen for you? uh, So I guess um, I actually didn't start low carb for my fibromyalgia. I didn't even know that there was a connection. I actually started it just for weight loss. Um, And I'd been one of those classic yo-yo dieters my whole life. Um, I had the motivation. I had the, you know, supposedly had the training, um, you know, having studied nutrition, but um, nothing, nothing stuck. And um, so eventually I, being sugar-free for quite a number of years, you know, the more you look into sugar-free, then low carb comes up and it's a bit of a a spectrum. Then when you look at low carb, then you get to keto and then you look at keto and then you see carnivore and, you know, it's kind of this, this whole big spectrum. So I started on the the sugar-free side um, and then found low carb. And I thought, right, I'm, I'm going to really do this, like commit like 110%. I was determined. I, I felt really horrible in my body. I didn't like the way I looked or felt. And so I really, really stuck to it. And, um, you know, it took quite a long time because I think my body's quite resistant to weight loss, but it, it, but it worked. And I wasn't feeling starving and deprived the whole time, which was amazing revelation that I could actually eat delicious food and feel like I wasn't, you know, desperate to eat something other than lettuce leaves. So, um, so that was my, my first sort of introduction into low carb. Um, and then as I started to realize that it wasn't just the weight loss, that I was having so many other benefits and I started looking more into keto and the biggest difference for me really in terms of my fibromyalgia was going from low carb to keto, because even though low carb was helpful, keto was like just another level. Like I I think for me, the ketones themselves were really, really powerful because they have an anti-inflammatory property. They dampen an overactive nervous system, which is pretty much what fibromyalgia is. Um, And it increases the calming neurotransmitters, GABA. And so all these things for me, like it was the actual ketones. It wasn't just what I wasn't eating. It was what my body was producing from these ketones that was really making the the biggest difference for me. So um, through my whole journey, I lost 30 kilos, which is great. But coming out the other end, it's, it's not the most important thing. The most important thing was something I never saw happening, which was that I can function as a relatively normal human being, which I, you know, I just couldn't before, like, you know, I would get a a cold and I would be bedridden for weeks. You know, I, every time I bent over, I thought, is my whole back going to spasm? You know, I, I could hardly walk around the block. I was just a mess and I was in pain every day and you know it was just debilitating it really was debilitating and so for me this journey you know starting with weight loss but ending in getting my life back you know the fact that I can actually you know run a business you know I've got two kids one of them's got a disability you know it's a it's a big it's a big thing you know I've I've got a lot on my plate and the fact that I can actually you know really just function the way I do is just all down to my lifestyle and 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 it's not all diet I mean I I, you know I I say it's like a puzzle and that's the biggest piece of the puzzle but I do other things as well I'm not saying that it's only that but for me that's just been huge absolutely huge yeah and 
it it isn't only that I agree, but when you're talking about a metabolic um, machinery, if you like, you know, how our body is functioning to give us energy. I mean, that primarily is diet. Yeah, we know stress and, you know, all of that can throw that out. And that's a real issue for a lot of people. And I've seen clients, you know, I've had clients that they get the diet right, but they're still not getting the results they want. And I think that is when stress, you know, has to be looked at. But you know, by far the biggest impact we can have is is around choosing, you know, what we do put in our mouth. I've got, I've got some questions I want to ask you around that because that is truly phenomenal. I mean, I really didn't have an idea of how the extent to to what you've been through. So you've, did you say 30 kilos that you've yeah. lost? Yeah. I mean, that that is phenomenal. You did say it it took a long time. I see this so much. I mean, we've spent years getting to where we are and getting, you know, yeah. the issues and the problems that we've got. And we kind of want to undo things overnight. But I've, I mean, it took me four or five years. But I'm interested in what it, you know, how that looked for you when you say it took a long time. So I think I lost the majority of my weight probably in the first couple of years with low carb and then probably the last little bit with keto. Um, you know, I reckon probably, yeah, it was probably two, three years overall. Um, and, you know, I, m- my motto is so long as I was heading in the right direction, I didn't care. Like I was just like, so long as I'm not going backwards, like that's all that matters, you know. And and there were times when I plateaued and, of course, anyone hits a plateau, they freak out, you know, but the body has to like realign and get used to the new weight and then it can move on again. And sometimes you do need to add something else, you know, and I think for me, you know, I started with low carb and I went to keto. So that was a shift and that did definitely help move me in the, you know, the, get those last few kilos off. Um, and also um, I introduced intermittent fasting, which I never would have done at the beginning. I mean, I just couldn't. I mean, I was so reliant on carbohydrates that if I didn't eat for a few hours, I felt like I was dying, you know, like yeah. so I, I like that just, and I would never recommend anyone to do intermittent fasting unless they're fat adapted. Like I think it's so important to teach your body how to use fat for fuel because then when you don't eat, You've got fuel there and you don't have those crashes, you know, and I think so many people, they want to do everything all at once. So they just want to dive in and do keto and intermittent fasting overnight, you know, and I just would never recommend that to anyone. Like I, especially if you've got fibromyalgia um, and I, I have to say, actually, if I could go back in time, I would give myself some advice (laughs) when I first started, even though I was going low carb and not keto initially, I still think I did it way too quickly for my fibromyalgia. So when you've got fibromyalgia, there there is some, I mean, there's not a lot of research, but there is some research showing that you don't metabolize carbohydrates very well and that that could be part of the issue. And I think that when I went from, you know, a fairly carb heavy diet to low carb, my body took a long time to transition so that, you know, I think I really, I went through a good few weeks where my body just didn't have enough energy. Like it it didn't have it from the carbs because I wasn't giving it carbs anymore. And it didn't have it from my fat stores because it didn't know how to access them. So I think that, you know, I honestly, and I wasn't taking electrolytes, which now obviously I know that was a big problem. Yeah, Um, we live and learn. (laughs) Exactly. Um, And, you know, I think that for me, I, if I didn't have the willpower and determination, most people in my position, I think would have just said, you've got to be kidding. I feel like I'm dying. Why am I doing this to myself? Mm. But I had just committed 110%. So I was going to do it. Mm. But actually what I should have done is done some research into troubleshooting why I felt like I did, um, which obviously since then I've done an awful lot of research. But you know, at that point in time, I was just thinking weight loss, this is going to work. It's undetermined. I'm just going to do it no matter what. And I think that it really put a big toll on my body. So, um, yeah, I think if I could go back in time, I'm definitely the electrolytes, but also I think I'd do it far more gradually uh, and really give my body time to adapt. And I think anyone with fibromyalgia knows that our systems are very easily overwhelmed and when it comes to what you eat, what you exercise, you know, everything that you do, you have to be super mindful that you're not like everybody else. You mm. can't just jump in the deep end. Mm. You know, you can't just say, 
hey, great, I'm going to do keto overnight or, hey, I'm going to just start intermittent fasting or I'm going to go to the gym and just start lifting weights when I've never done weights in my life. You know, you, you just, you can't do any of those things. You know, everything has to be gradual, careful, baby steps, you know, and I think that's the key to success with fibromyalgia is to take things really slowly. You don't want to shock your system. You want to gradually introduce it just yeah, just really, really gradually. I think it's a very important point because a lot of people hear me say, you know, keto is amazing for my fibromyalgia and they just want to go, great, well, I'm just going to do fibro. I'm just going to do keto for my fibro. And it's like, yeah, okay, let's try that. But don't just jump straight in the deep end. Let's do mm. it slowly. Mm. So I, I actually think, think that's a great advice probably for everybody, you know, like I, I, I think I did do it slowly because I didn't know. I mean, this 10 years ago when, you know, the, the depth of information just wasn't there like it is today. But my path was very similar to yours, not fibromyalgia, but Hashimoto's, you know, prediabetes, fatty liver. And, you know, it was sugar first, then low carb, and then keto. And I think this, I, I really want to talk about understanding the difference between just being low carb and the ketogenic you know, diet and how it's not keto foods that it, there's no such thing as keto foods. We're looking at how our body metabolizes and makes energy for us. And I think there's a lot of misunderstandings around what it is, but also there's a lot of fear. I see people, you know, talking about, oh, well, you don't want to be keto for forever. It's not. And, and I'm like, Hmm. You know, isn't it interesting that that concept, because if you vow, you know, if some, something like fibromyalgia, if you have mental, you know, you want your brain to be really sharp, um, you, you're really doing things to uh, avoid dementia or any sort of brain, well, it's kind of an, an, a sugar addiction as well. I mean, you really do want to remain as, as much as you can in that. So I want to come back and, and ask you about that, but also um, how common is fibromyalgia and please excuse my ignorance but I know I'm, I'm asking this question too for people listening like is it an autoimmune condition is it genetic is it lifestyle like what do you know now that you can share around yeah so um so fibromyalgia it's really not very well understood and it's one of those things that literally it's sort of like a list of symptoms you know, tick the boxes and, you know, you because you've got this group of symptoms, you've got fibromyalgia. So um, the main one is widespread pain. So not just pain in one area, but, you know, lower body, upper body, right side, left side. Um, my pain, um, not as much now because I don't have as much, but it would move. So I would I'd have a sore neck and then the next day it'd be a sore back and then the next day it'd be a sore leg. And then, you know, like it just was like this really weird random pain that just just kept moving. Um, and so, you know, you go to the osteo and, and they'd sort of, you know, work on one area and you go back the next time and you'd say, oh, you know, it's somewhere else. And I honestly think they thought I was loony, you know, until I actually got the diagnosis. Um, sleep issues is also another a big one um, with fibromyalgia, um, things like um, anxiety and brain fog. They call it fibro fog. Um, and that that's, yeah, made a big difference to me. Like my brain is, you know, fires so much better now than it than it used to um and there's like there's a million other symptoms that you may or may not have you know there's sort of like associations you know like it's you're more likely to have things like restless legs which i have uh sleep apnea which luckily i don't have um it, there's all sorts of things um mood issues um but basically the the definition it's pretty vague. There, there are spots on the body that they actually prod. And if those particular spots hurt, then they are associated with fibromyalgia. So when I first got diagnosed, the um, the doctor, you know, prodded me in all these spots. And, you know, every time he prodded, I'd go, ouch. And, you know, like, um, and then it, it was it was handled very poorly. I was literally leaving the neurologist's office. And as I was walking out the door, he said, I could diagnose you with fibromyalgia, but what would be the point? What? And this is as I'm leaving. And I thought, oh my God, what? I didn't even know what fibromyalgia was. And so I left in the days thinking, whoa, what? I don't understand. And then, of course, my issues just kept going because no one had helped me. And so I went back to the GP and the GP said, well, this is ongoing. I need to send you back to that same doctor. So I went back to the same doctor and he prodded and poked again and asked questions again. And yes, I had all the symptoms, blah, blah, blah. So he said, oh, well, I'll diagnose you with fibromyalgia. 
I said, okay, great. Diagnosis is good. Once you've got a label, then that means you, you've got knowledge and power and you can do something about it. That's what I thought. Ha uh-huh. ha. Um, <laughs> and he said, oh, look, there's nothing really you can do. Oh, there's one drug you could try. And, you know, exercise helps some people. Oh, my and I God. Said, I said, so um, with this medication, I said, is it going to change my life? I said, I'm not a big fan of medication. You know, if it's going to change my life, I might give it a go. But if it's not, then really I'm not going to bother. And he said, no, nah, won't change your life. You might get a mild help, you know. And I said, well, forget it then, you know. So he was absolutely useless, you know. Wow. He didn't even tell me what it was, Um I mean, I've, I've, I've since learned that it, it's basically an overactive nervous system. So mm. the, the body overreacts to things, sends a pain signal when, in fact, for someone who doesn't have fibro, that signal would not be sent because it's there's nothing actually happening. So, you know, I could just be leaning over or bending or doing something that for most people, why would the body send a pain signal? There is no reason. There's no danger. Pain is there to tell you something's wrong. I can do something perfectly innocent, normal, you know, and then my body goes, ah, pain and sends a signal, even though there's no damage. So right. that, that's the bottom line is that it's an overactive nervous system. And that's why ketones help because they, or one of the reasons they help is because they help to dampen that overactive nervous system and not be quite so trigger happy to tell you there's pain when there's, when there's not. Um, and it's a lot more common in women too. I was that, going to say, is it a yeah. female? Mm. And, and they think that there can be potentially genetic, uh, like it can run in families, but certainly doesn't have to. Um, it, it's very poorly understood. It really, you know, it, it really is one of those things where they just have this kind of checklist of symptoms, put them in a category, you know, and say, right, well, everybody who experiences all of those symptoms, you know, we, like if we've ruled out other things, that's it, you know. So. Mm-hmm. It, it it really is poorly understood. Um, but there is research about um, low carb and, and keto, not a lot, but um, there is research to show that um, reducing carbohydrates and sugar can increase quality of life um, and also reduce pain um, and especially sugar. So mm. um, it, it doesn't, um, some people I think benefit from the ketones as well, but not everybody. Okay. Some people don't find that much of a difference, but in my experience, sugar is the number one thing. So yeah. if if you did nothing else, just cutting out sugar could really improve your symptoms. And then the next step would be, well, you know, once you've got that down pat, then you could try low carb. And then if that, you know, helped, then you could try keto, but not everyone does. Like I've got clients that they might try keto because they've heard that I've done it and it's worked for me. And they say, you know what? So long as I don't eat refined carbs and sugar, I'm fine. I can have a bit of sweet potato or rice and, you know, it doesn't seem to make that much difference to me. So that's fine. If that's what they want to do, then, you know, that, that works for them. But I just know that that's keto works for me. And so like you were saying before, in terms of people say, don't do it in the long term. For me, I consider it therapeutic. It's like medicine. Ketones are literally like medicine for me. So you would never say to somebody, you know, who was like a type one diabetic, well, you know, you shouldn't take insulin. You know, they need it. It is therapeutic. Mm-hmm. I need the ketones in my body. Mm, and I love uh, that. That's such a great yeah. way to describe it. Yeah. That's how it feels to me, you know, yep. so I'll have people say to me, oh, but, you know, it's just once. Why don't you eat this piece of cake or why don't you have this or why don't you have that? And I, you know, I always say, look, I, I really appreciate it, but for me it's not worth it. And and some people will, you know, most people are pretty good, but some people will keep pushing and I literally have to say, you know, that is like poison for me. Yeah. You know, I need my medicine, which is ketones. If I eat that cake, I will not be producing ketones anymore and I will feel miserable and mm. it's not worth it. And I just am not going to do it. Mm. So it That's so, be, yeah, you absolutely. do. Yep, you do. You have to be so uh, true and that can be really uncomfortable. But also too, you know, knowing that the more you, distance you have between, you know, that type of thing and how good you feel, it's kind of like, like I look at all that stuff now. It has no appeal. Like, well, I could, there is no way, I would literally have to be, like it'd be the only thing I could eat on this earth and between that and dying and that'd be the only reason I have it. But like 
you know, go for, you know, I understand you eat it. I'm never going to tell you. It's like, you know, with the work we do, you know, people get a little bit funny and they're kind of like, you know, the way they react sometimes. I'm like, this is my choice. This is what I do. This works for me. And I'll help anyone who wants to explore that for themselves. But, you know, you do you. That's fine. Just don't tell me to do what you're doing. Yes. And I think some people do feel like you're judging them mm-hmm. by not having something. It's mm. like you're saying, because I'm not having it, you shouldn't have it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Anna, what, are we saying that? No, we're no. not. <laughs> Everyone gets to choose for themselves mm-hmm. and they also get the ramifications of those choices. Yeah. So if you're going to ask me, is it good for someone to eat chocolate cake every day? I'm going to say no. Mm-hmm. Am I going to judge you for eating chocolate cake every day? No, but I might tell you that perhaps you'd be better off without it. Mm. That's not being judgmental. That's just factual. That's That's just, you know, there are studies showing ultra processed food increase, you know, mortality and all the chronic diseases. It shouldn't be something that's up for debate, even though somehow it is sometimes. (laughs) Um, But, you know, but that's not that's not about saying someone should or shouldn't do something. That's just about, well, here's the information you then make the choice. Yep. I've made the choice that I feel so much better eating this way, so that's what I'm going to do. Mm. That, that's just as simple as that. It is. And, and I think too, like it's interesting, the the perceived leap I think people have mentally around low-carb to ketogenic. Um, and there is a lot, I see a lot of sort of fear around that, oh, I have to be really restricted and it, it have to be really tight in that. And I think, yeah, you know, when you're building that machinery, you know, you probably do want to be pretty, pretty tight and restrictive if you want to actually get that happening. But it's also that you can't truly know how good it feels to you do try it and you go through those, you know, your body actually being able to, to produce ketones. So talk, um, explain to someone listening who doesn't really i mean because keto is just like what is keto people think it's a bar i mean can you explain in simple terms what it actually is yes yes so um keto is actually i mean ketones themselves are something that your body actually produces and they produce it as a form of energy when you're not giving your body enough carbohydrates to use for energy So the difference between low carb and keto is just that low carb can be, well, different people have different definitions of low carb. There is no absolute definition. A lot of people would say under 50 grams would be of carbohydrates per day would be low carb, but then there are others who say a hundred or some people even 120. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a bit on the high side. Um, but yeah, under a hundred, you could probably safely say that's, you know, compared to the average diet, that's probably more like 300 grams of carbs a day, you know, and, and technically, if you actually look up Wikipedia, the definition is anything less than the average. So basically that means if the average is 300, that if you're eating 250, that you're low carb. Well, I think that's rubbish. I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. Um, but you let's safely say, you know, 50 to hundred grams is low carb. That's what probably what most people would say. If you get to sort of 20 to 30 grams of carbs, and this is different for everybody, but most people, if they're eating 20 to 30 grams or less of carbs, will start to produce more ketones. I mean, everyone produces a tiny number, but you'll be in what's called nutritional ketosis. So ketosis, you know, it's, it's something that happens within your body. Your body says, oh, I haven't got enough carbohydrates for energy. I need more sources of energy. And so it uses fat to create ketones. And these ketones are the things that I was talking about before that have in and of themselves the benefits of being, you know, anti-inflammatory and increasing calming neurotransmitters and all that sort of stuff. So they've got positive attributes and no, you can't just take a pill. (laughs) Oh, You can buy ketones, but I tell you, they will increase your ketone levels so small, such a small Mm. amount that it's not even, Mm -hmm. you know, it might be useful. um, And I'm sure there'll be a lot of research in this in coming years for things like Alzheimer's, for example, when Mm. the brain cannot access the glucose and so it needs the ketones to help it to fuel. I would think, even though a ketogenic diet would be ideal, but if you couldn't get someone on a ketogenic diet, I would imagine that taking it as a supplement could be helpful but that's something that requires a lot more research so um but yeah just for the average person 
uh, the difference is just in the amount of carbohydrates that you eat and whether or not your body has low enough carbohydrate levels to produce ketones. And that will vary depending on, you know, a whole bunch of factors, you know, things like how much muscle you have, for example, because the more muscle you have, the more glucose is going to go into that muscle. So the more carbs you could eat before your ketone levels started going down. Mm. Whereas someone who doesn't have a lot of muscle, all that glucose is going to go flooding into the, the blood and you know, then be used for energy. So, mm-hmm. yeah, there are, there are definitely factors and in individuals and how big you are, and you know, all sorts of stuff that will affect that. But generally speaking, if you're sort of you know twenty to thirty grams of carbs or less, you will be in nutritional ketosis, and you'll have those benefits above and beyond the benefits that you might have got just from low carb, which still can be incredible, yep. have yep. amazing benefits. And a lot of people want to do that because they do want to have a little bit more flexibility. Um, to have those extra little bits of, you know, maybe a bit of fruit or whatever it is they want to include in their diet. And that's fine. If that works for them, I have nothing against that. But for me, like I said, ketones are therapeutic. And so that's why I always try and stay in ketosis. Yeah. And I agree too, for me, that was really the magic um, that I, that it took me a while to get there and to understand it. But, you know, coming from that perspective of, you know, I suppose, um, dependencies on sugar and alcohol for me, you know, which is very, you know, similar in the brain, but it, it made a massive difference. It wasn't everything, you know, there was still a lot of work I had to do, but, you know, just that baseline of, of at least the way I, I talk about it is like my brain started showing up for me. Like I was able to see things that I just couldn't see. And I, I wasn't in that constant, um, deprived you know you talked about that at the start that's it is a very real thing and I think we don't know that that's possible not to feel that you know we again we have to go through the experience to to feel it and once we see it um it can totally change our life um what's the difference between uh being in nutritional ketosis and being fat adapted um so I suppose you can be fat adapted without being in ketosis. You could be low carb and your body will use the carbs first because that's just the way we're designed. But once it runs out of carbs, it will then use fat. And if you have fat in your diet, it will use that. And if it doesn't have fat from your diet, it will take the fat off your body. So it will, and then ketosis is, if you are in ketosis for a period of time, then you would you would just be fat adapted because you just can't eat carbohydrates that the amounts that are so low you'd need for, you know, the keto diet that you, you just automatically would be fat adapted because you have been super low carb for, you know, a period of time Mm. to get yourself into that. So Mm. fat adaptation process, I I guess, comes um, gradually and it it can take a different amount of time for different people. Um, And, but that normally happens once you go low carb and then, you'd be yeah, super duper fat adapted once you get to keto. Like I said before, it's it's kind of on that sort of spectrum, you know, mm. that, that you have. So, yeah, low carbs kind of in the middle and keto sort of further up that end. Yeah. And and what happens, what have you noticed happened with yourself and with your um, clients over um, so a longer time? So how long would you say you've kind of been in this way? And what have you, I mean, do you still test your ketones? Do you just know like how does that look? Because I, I do believe that our body becomes really efficient and, you know, I've seen people chasing ketones and then it becomes almost like an obsession, like the scale that, oh, I'm only producing this now, what's going on? And, you know, again, I think we need to step back and look at the big picture. Our bodies are amazingly clever and we're, we're kind of probably only going to be producing what we need. Um, so what what's your sort of insight around that? Um, yeah, so I guess I've been low carb for about six years Um, and I've been keto for about four. Okay. So, um, I think that, um, it's definitely true that people do chase ketones because people love numbers, you know, they Mm. love seeing the number on the scale go down and they love seeing the ketone number go up. Um, I think that the most valuable time to test your ketones is when you're first going keto Mm -hmm. because you want to know that you're doing the right thing. You're not accidentally eating carbs that you, you know, were hidden in something that you weren't sure about. So if I've got someone and they swear to me that they've been, you know, eating, you know, like what they consider to be keto for a month and they're not showing ketones, 
then you've got to look at exactly what they're eating and are they eating a huge amount of nuts that they think are, you know, pure protein when in fact, you know, there's an awful lot of fat and there's some carbs in there, you know, are they, you know, eating a whole lot of, you know, supposedly low carb things that, you know, on a packet, it says lower carb, you know, but actually it's only 20% lower and it was so high to start with that actually it's super high, you know? So, Mm -hmm. um, so at the beginning, it's really good to have that, um, validation i guess that you are actually eating the number of carbs that you think you are and that you are on the right track um and it can also be a really great tool for knowing how certain things affect you because everyone's affected differently by different foods so some people might be in ketosis you know just going along and they suddenly say you know what i just want to try like it's someone's birthday i want to have a piece of cake and just see what happens you know and some people that might just completely throw them out of ketosis and other people it might make the ketones go down but not right out of ketosis uh, some people it might you know make it take a long time to get back. Others they get back quicker. So it's just really handy, I think, as a tool to say, okay, you know what? If I want to, I can do X, Y, and Z. You know, and I know that this is the reaction. You know, or oh my goodness, I'm never going to touch that because I know that you know my ketones disappeared for three days and I felt terrible. Mm. You know, so. Yeah. It it gives you a bit more information, I guess. Mm, mm, Um, But that's what we should be treating it as, information, not validation. It doesn't mean you're a good person. It doesn't, you know, like it's, it's just useful. But once you get the hang of it and once, you know, like at the beginning doing keto, I honestly believe you should weigh and measure things. And that I'm not a weighing measuring person. That is not my general way of doing things. But just initially, even if it's only for a few days or a week, just so that you can see what's in things. Because even having studied nutrition, I was shocked when I first started weighing and measuring things. I really, you know, there were just foods that I was just like, wow, that's so much more of whatever it is than I thought, you know, in that quantity. Because mm quantities that we eat too are not necessarily the same as what a serving size says so you might think that you're having a reasonable portion of something and then you look at the serving size on the packet and go oh my goodness I just ate twice as much as that serving size and that doesn't mean that I'm a pig that means probably that the company wants you to believe that a serving size is small so that they can tell you hey per serve it's only got you know whatever 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 so I think it's really useful at the beginning to weigh and measure things and that way you know. But then having the, you know, I use the breath meter for the ketones. There are other ways to measure, but I think that's the least icky, the quickest, the, you know, just the best all around. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so once I, I do that, then, you know, I'm weighing and measuring things, but I'm also seeing, okay, how long does it take me to get into ketosis? If I eat something that knocks me out, how long does it take me to get back again? You know, it just gives me this information. And then after, to be honest, after the first month or two, you probably don't need it as much. Mm. Having said that, every now and again, I do it just to check. Yeah. You know, just to sort of see, mm. especially mm. if not that I eat off plan very often, but if on the random, you know, occasion it was my birthday and I ate something, you know, I might just check. Just It's just out of interest at this point in time because I mm. know, you know, I know what to eat to keep me in ketosis and my ketone levels stay very, very consistent um, because I eat very consistently. Yeah. So that's the goal. The goal is to not need to te- check because you know where you're going to be because you know that you're eating consistently. And that is that is the ultimate goal. Yeah, and you feel that good, right? Time. Of course, yes, yeah. <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah. And again, it, it, it kind of aligns with the wisdom of our body and, and what we're noticing too. And I think over time we just, you know what it's like? Um, it's like uh, you can hear everything clearer like it's just so you know when you're in that carb fog like we've all been in for years and you know I was exactly the same with on and off diets and all this stuff and you know you couldn't there was no wisdom in that I couldn't hear it because it was just so clouded from trying to do things that I was asking it to do it just could anyway and I this is the the beauty of it I think we have to give it time and then we can start to trust our body and I know 
I, I mean, I don't test either now and rarely. Occasionally I get it out if I'm showing a client or just having a bit of fun or something, you know, just just to see. Like I, if I do a, like a three-day fast, which I do maybe once every three months, it's amazing. Actually, I get it up really high. It's, it's cool. But then, you know, I don't really test much either. But I just know that, you know, there is such a mirror between what it's saying and how I feel. Like I can see it. And yes. whether it's been, you know, not necessarily even eating differently. My eating's the same as you. I'm pretty much the same each day. Um, my cravings are, you know, under control. I don't have any of that stuff. But sometimes I might not sleep well. Like I might have been woken up or I've been sick or, you know, my kids, you know, that sort of stuff can throw it out, but I don't, I don't overly stress about that because I know it's, it, it's a temporary thing. And I know that, you know, my body will ride itself. Yes. I think that's a really important point. You know, people think it's just food, but it's not, you know, it's yeah, it's whether you're sick, it's exercise, it's stress, it's sleep, it's medications. It's, you know, so many different things that can yeah. affect your glucose levels and your ketone levels. Um, but you know, like you said, it's just, it's a blip, you know, you're going to, it's temporary. You're going to get over that. And then you just go back to normal and, um, you know, don't stress about it because the stressing about it makes it worse. Makes it worse. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. It's like, it's like throwing petrol into the fire. I know. And I know it's hard when you say don't stress, but it's kind of like, yeah, well, I get it. It's natural, but it's like, you can, you can really step away from that and just trust, trust your body, trust yourself, trust that things will re will write itself. Uh, you know, I've loved this conversation, Carla. You are coming to speak uh, in Melbourne at the Lived Experiences in Health and Healing uh, conference that I'm organising. And you really, you know, from the conversation today, I'm so, so excited that you are coming. You have a, a wealth of personal lived experience and and also being in the trenches, trenches so to speak, working with with people as well. Do you want to just share a little bit around what you are going to to bring to that and what you're looking forward to about that weekend? Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. I, I can't wait for that weekend. I think it's going to be fabulous. Um, and I think, you know, the thing that really differentiates it from other conferences is that lived experiences. So, you know, often when I give um, talks at conferences, people say to me, you should have talked more about your experiences. And I say, well, yeah, but I was too busy covering the topic, you know, and they say, yeah, but it's so motivating to actually hear your personal experiences, you know, and a lot of people do want to know, you know, what is the difference? Why did I find that there was a difference between low carb and keto? And, you know, how did my journey unfold? And, um, you know, and I often don't have time to really delve into that in more detail because the topic that I'm talking about isn't fibromyalgia. So I'm, yeah, I'm just really looking forward to being able to just concentrate on that and on my experiences and, you know, just tips for anybody else who's got fibromyalgia or knows anyone because, you know, it's, it's become, it seems to be becoming more common. Mm -hmm. I don't know the statistics about that, but, um, you know, I just think that it can be really empowering to hear somebody who's, you know, who's just going through the same things as you, but who has some some tips and who has some ideas about things that work and, um, you know, things to try. So, yeah, I'm just really looking forward to, to delving into that. So can't wait. Yeah, I can't wait. I, I think it's um, the stories and the personal experiences help people really just get a bit of clarity, I think, in their own mind. And it gives them the hope that, you know, if they're sitting in this sort of space where they just can't see you know, a light at the end of the tunnel or, or a path for them to take, you know, hearing other people's perspective, especially practitioners, you know, I think it's it's one thing we can, you know, a lot of the conferences people get up and just share knowledge. Yeah, I mean, knowledge is important, but it's like, what do we do with that knowledge? How do we take that knowledge and make it really real in our life? And I think when we hear how others have done it, it allows us to just get a little bit curious and and experiment and try different things. And the other part of the workshop, which I'm really excited about, so you are giving a talk and also you'll be involved in a little Q&A session as well. So, the, you know, there's only 50 people that are going to be there. It's, there's going to be opportunities to really sit like I'm just so thrilled to be doing with you now and just asking questions and just, you know, just exploring how your lived experience. So thrilled you're going to be a part of it. And, um, yeah, people, if you're watching or listening, you know, grab a ticket and and come to Yes, it'll be cold. It'll be chilly, middle of winter, but I promise the place will be super warm and the company will just be incredibly enriching and inspiring. Can't wait. Yeah, can't wait. Well, thank you, Carla, so much for coming and talking to me today. And I so look forward to June 
Um, if anyone wants to reach out to you, obviously I'm going to have below all your uh, contact details so they can contact you. But thank you for for having the courage to share your lived experience and how it's looked to you and also to say that, you know, this is how it works for me, but there are other pathways that that may work for you as well. There's no one size fits all and I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thanks, Carla.